How many fans of musicals do we have here this morning? Okay. It's a solid majority. So maybe you enjoy the sound of music. Okay. Some sound of music fans. Uh, Wicked, uh, Hamilton, Greatest Showman. Okay. Okay. Kids, maybe Frozen, Encanto, adults too. My house is filled with it. <laughs> well, I have bad news for you musical fans. I am not among you. <laughs> I'm not part of the fan club. I'm not, I know. And, and I struggle to enjoy musicals because the whole time I'm thinking, why are you singing? You're just standing in a field. You're doing a business transaction. Why are you singing? What good reason do you have to just be spontaneously bursting out in song? Well, you may or may not realize this, but Luke chapters 1 and 2 are a spirit-inspired musical. So I'd invite you to go ahead and open up to Luke chapter 1. So these chapters contain the infancy narratives about the the birth of John the Baptist, the birth of Jesus. But unlike Matthew's gospel, Luke fills his account with singing. At first, we hear one voice begin to sing, the voice of Mary in our passage today. She's singing a song that we already sang together this morning and we'll sing again. And then Zechariah begins to sing. And then the heavenly host joins in the singing. And then finally, Simeon bursts out in song. And why is this happening? Why are they singing? What good reason do they have? Well, it turns out they have a really good reason. (laughs) I heard someone say, Jesus. (laughs) Yes. Luke wants us to see that God has kept all of his promises that the long-expected Messiah has finally arrived and God's people can't help but to sing. So let's look at our passage. It's Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 56. Hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? (laughs) For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. 
He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for giving us your word and even for inspiring this very passage. We know that your word is more valuable than gold. It is sweeter than honey. So help us to savor this passage together. But you would open the eyes of our hearts that we might behold glorious things from your word. Help us to see the glory of you, our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We trust that you'll do this because we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. In our, in our passage this morning, verses 39 through 45 really set the context for the centerpiece here, which is the song of Mary. But as we start, remember that last week Mary was told by the angel Gabriel that She was going to conceive through the power of the Holy Spirit, the very Son of God himself, even though she was a virgin. That's a pretty big deal. And now that she's pregnant, she goes to spend three months visiting with her relative Elizabeth. And these two would have a lot to talk about. They were both expecting, so that's a lot of conversation material right there. But more than that, they were both told by an angel that they would miraculously conceive. Again, pretty big deal. Elizabeth was elderly and barren, and she had miraculously conceived the final prophet of the Old Covenant era, the forerunner to the Messiah, John the Baptist. And Mary was a young virgin, and she had miraculously conceived the Messiah himself, the Savior of the world, Jesus. But did you notice that Mary only gets the chance to say hello to Elizabeth before Elizabeth is filled with the Spirit and starts to speak? She pronounces a blessing on Mary and a blessing on the fruit of Mary's womb, that is, the the unborn infant, Jesus She calls Mary the mother of my Lord. She recognized that Mary believed that the word spoken to her from the Lord would ultimately be fulfilled. And remember, Mary hasn't told her anything yet. The Holy Spirit in a moment gave supernatural insight to Elizabeth. And what a confirmation, what an encouragement this must have been for Mary. She was an impoverished, unwed, pregnant teenager. Now, yes, she was the mother of God. But no one else knew that. There would have been a huge social stigma hanging over the head of this young woman. Imagine how many people doubted her. Imagine how many people shamed her or even rejected her. So to find out that not only did Elizabeth believe her, but that the truth was supernaturally revealed to Elizabeth directly from the Holy Spirit himself, that must have been a huge relief. But not just a relief, a joy. Did you notice that this passage is just overflowing with joy? You can hear it in the words of Elizabeth. She exclaimed with a loud cry. Almost every sentence she says begins with, blessed. She's excited. She's thrilled. Even the unborn baby in her womb leaped for joy. He rejoiced in utero. And remember back in in chapter 1 and verse 15, it was promised that John the Baptist would be filled with the Spirit even from his mother's womb. And here it is. And right out of the gate, we see a crucial insight. 
that this verse is a great blow against the lies of abortion. We know medically that unborn infants can feel pain. And we know biblically that unborn children can experience joy. So their precious lives should be 100% protected. So both mother and son, both Elizabeth and John are filled with the Spirit, and they're both filled with joy. I mean, John is only in the, the second or third trimester, and he's rejoicing because he's in the presence of Jesus. And then Mary just can't help but to join in the celebration. So she just spontaneously bursts into a song of praise. And remember, the, the theme so far in our study of the Gospel of Luke has been good news of great joy. Here it is. This passage is full of joy and wonder and amazement and excitement. So we need to slow down and ask, why? Why are these people so excited? Why are they so fired up? What is the source of so much rejoicing, so much singing? How can we cultivate this kind of joy in our own hearts, in our own lives? I know that for many of us, joy can seem so elusive. It feels like it just slips through our fingers. You might be like me, more of a, a cynic who wonders why people would ever burst into spontaneous singing. You know, even this morning, I, I was asking people to pray for me because I woke up. I knew I was preaching a passage on joy. I didn't feel it. I was empty and dry this morning. The Lord has helped me. So let's see if God has a word for us. I think he will. A word that might lead us into deeper, God-centered, experiential joy. And let's just allow this passage to guide us as we ask two crucial questions. What was the source of Mary's joy? And what is the source of our joy? What was the source of Mary's joy then? And what is the source of our joy now? I want us to hear this from Mary herself. So let's just walk through her song. And as we do, I pray that the Holy Spirit will, will take our affections, even if they're low, even if they're just smoldering embers right now, and fan them into flame so that we can't help but join Mary in joyful songs of praise. Let's immerse ourselves in this beautiful, spirit-breathed poem. And as we do, we'll see that Mary's song is scripture-saturated. It's intimately personal. And it's deeply subversive. So first, her song is scripture-saturated. As Mary begins to sing, her song is overflowing with scripture. Mary's mind and, and her heart was so obviously saturated in God's word. And make no mistake, she was a teenager, she was young, and she was a serious theologian. She was thinking deeply about God and his word. And in this short song, she alludes to the scriptures over and over again. There are allusions to Hannah's song in 1 Samuel 2, to God's promises to Abraham in Genesis 12, 15, and 17, and to the Psalter in Psalm 8, Psalm 34, Psalm 78, Psalm 103, Psalm 107, Psalm 111, and Psalm 138. This song is filled to the brim with Bible. So I want to ask you, what is your knee-jerk response to the thought of reading your Bible. Now, of course, we all know that we need to be in the Word, but how do you feel about being in the Word? Does it seem more like a chore? Is it like medicine? You know, it's good for you, but it's not always the most pleasant of experiences. 
Does God tell us to read the Bible like a parent tells their child to eat their vegetables? The answer is no. Reading God's word is a delight. It's not a duty. It's a delight. The time we spend in reading and studying and meditating on the Bible, it isn't a legalistic requirement. It's an invitation by God to enjoy him through feasting on his word. The Bible isn't just a dusty old book. It isn't just a collection of nice moral tales. It isn't just an ancient text for for scholars and intellectuals to analyze and debate. No, the Bible is an exciting book. It's exhilarating. It's thrilling when you get into it. It's a source of true joy. This book is meant to be enjoyed and savored. But we can know that and it still not be true for us. It doesn't seem true for us. It doesn't feel true for us. So what if we don't? What if we're sitting there staring at our Bibles and it looks more like vegetables than a nice juicy steak? What do we do? My exhortation and encouragement to you is this. Pray and act. Pray, God, light me up. Set my heart ablaze and then get in the word. Stare at the word. Because whether you feel it or not, it is good. It is satisfying. It is joyful. Mary's delight and pleasure and gladness and joy was fueled by sinking her roots deep into this. Sinking her roots deep into God's revealed truth in his word. She didn't get here by accident. So how can we join Mary in cultivating deeply rooted joy in God himself? Well, if you want to go deeper into the joyful worship of God, you need to go deeper in his word. The deeper your theology is, the higher your doxology will become. That is, the deeper you go into the truth of Scripture, the higher your praise for the author of Scripture and your enjoyment of him will ultimately become. Mary's song is filled with the words of God. I want to take just a moment to to thank and show appreciation to our worship team. They lead us every week in singing songs that are scripture saturated, that are doctrinally rich, that focus us and center us on Christ. Not every church has that. They tune our hearts to receive the word of God week after week. Thank you, worship team. And to the rest of us, my exhortation is is simple. Sing. Sing. Follow Mary. Join with her. Sing. Singing is the overflow of joy, and singing is what stirs up our joy in the Lord. Singing is what fuels our affection for Christ. How good is it that we get to gather week after week after week as the people of God to sing to Him, to sing to one another? This is a joyful privilege. Mary's song is saturated with Scripture. And especially the Old Testament. The New Testament wasn't written yet, by the way. (laughs) Let's skip ahead to the end of her song in verses 44 through 45. She ends her song like this. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Mary links God's redemptive acts and purposes, not just to her own experience, but to the larger story of Israel. Mary's song and the upcoming songs, especially of Zechariah and and Simeon, they show that the coming of Jesus, it isn't something brand new, but it's actually the fulfillment of the ancient promises of God. 
According to these songs, Jesus is the climax of a story that's been going on for a long time. He is the climax of Israel's story. Jesus is where everything has been going all along. This is what he says himself at the end of Luke's gospel. In Luke chapter 24, verse 44, the the recently resurrected Jesus tells his disciples that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So from Genesis to Revelation, we see a consistent narrative, a story that's all about one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the point. That's the point. We read the scripture so that we can see him. We read the scripture so that we can see Christ in all of his glory. This song, it is traditionally called the Magnificat a title that comes from the first word of uh, this song in Latin, the word magnify. Mary wants the Lord to be magnified. And John Piper has given a great illustration of this, that that we don't magnify the Lord like a microscope, where you take something small and try to make it appear bigger than it really is. No, we magnify God like a telescope, where we take something that's extremely large, yet hard to see, like a distant planet, and we magnify it to get a greater glimpse of its glory and its majesty. That's what Mary wants to do with God. She sees his greatness and his glory and his beauty and his majesty, and her heart wants to magnify this great God. Look at verse 49. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. Mary's soul was focused not on herself, but on her God. Now, Mary had every reason to be focused on herself. She had a lot going on. She could have been complaining and grumbling, but she wasn't. Mary's soul was focused on her God. And when you live your life focused on you, when the circumstances of your life becomes the focal point, it's difficult to experience serious joy. We are not a good source of happiness for ourselves. We know that from miserable experience, don't we? It is not that interesting. And we have way too many imperfections. But this is our default mode. We're naturally bent inward. We're naturally self-centered. But self-centeredness doesn't satisfy. But God does. He is the ultimate source of joy. So when you focus on him, when you center your thoughts and your affections on him, that's when you can start experiencing real solid joy. Mary was celebrating the attributes and the nature and the character and the person of who God is. She praised him for his holiness and for his greatness and for his strength and for his mercy. If you spend time in deep reflection on the character of God. You won't be able to stop yourself from singing. Because seeing the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ as revealed in God's word is a source of serious joy. So Mary's song is scripture saturated. And it's also intimately personal. We see this starting at verse 46. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Notice what Mary said. She said, my spirit rejoices in God, 
my Savior. He has done great things for me. Yes, she sees the big story of God throughout the Bible, what he's doing on a grand scale, but she also sees how her life, her own little seemingly insignificant story is being weaved by this sovereign God into his grand narrative of redemption. Her song isn't vague. Her song isn't general or abstract. For Mary and for us, worship is intimately personal. Because our God is an intimately personal God. (laughs) Mary's delight comes from knowing that this God is her God. He's taken notice of her. He's done great things for her. If you want to fan the flames of joy in your heart, spend time in the presence of the God who has taken notice of you personally. I know for some of you this is a fight. It's a battle. You know that the gospel is true. But you have to fight to believe and fight to to feel and to experience that it's really true for you personally. So dear believers, hear the good news. Jesus cares for you. Not just for others. For you. Jesus takes notice of you. He shows compassion to you. He lived for you. He died for you. He shed his blood for you. He defeated death for you. He is filled with love for you. He intercedes for you and he's coming back for you. Redemption is joyfully and deeply and intimately personal. And because of the greatness of her need and the greatness of God's provision, Mary responds with gratitude. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. And her words are proven true. Here we are, generations later, looking at what God did for Mary. But is this just true for her? Or can her joy become our joy? Can her blessing become our blessing? (laughs) We get keyed in on this later in Luke's gospel. In Luke chapter 11, verses 27 through 28, Jesus has been publicly teaching, and then we hear this. A woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, so she said to Jesus, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. So blessed is your mom, Mary. (laughs) But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. So Jesus is saying, in effect, yes, I love my mom. But no, she isn't more special or blessed than anyone else because true blessing comes to anyone who hears God's word and keeps it. And this is why we don't worship, venerate, or pray to Mary. We honor her. We don't downplay her at all. We honor her just as we honor all the faithful throughout history. But worship and glory belong to God and to God alone. In this passage, we see that Mary is a fellow worshiper alongside of us. She's not the one who is worshiped. She's giving God glory. She's not receiving glory from others. And she realized her need for a savior. She wasn't sinless. She was like us, in desperate need for salvation, grateful for such a Savior. (laughs) And if we put our faith in Jesus, if we hear God's word and keep it, we are blessed with the gracious gift of redemption, just like she was. So this morning, you can sing, my soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. You can say Jesus is my Savior, my Redeemer, my Lord, and my God. 
But for some of you, I want to ask, is your faith in Jesus actually your faith? Or are you living off a borrowed faith? If Mary was a teenager, maybe just 15 or 16. So I want to speak to you young adults. I want to speak to you teenagers, to you children, to any of you who grew up in church, who grew up in a Christian family. I want to ask you, are you living off the faith of mom and dad? Or grandma and grandpa, or whoever it is. Or have you put your faith personally in Jesus Christ alone as your only hope of being in a right relationship with God? If not, this redemption, this salvation, it's offered to you right now as a free gift. Look at verse 50. Mary says his mercy is for every generation. That means that this free gift of his mercy is offered to you right now, this very moment in this generation. Blessed are you if you hear God's word and keep it. So Mary's song is scripture saturated. It's intimately personal. And finally, it is deeply subversive. And at this point, Mary's song really takes a surprising turn. As we see starting at verse 51, where she sings, He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. <clears throat> he has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. So Mary is singing of God's greatness God's glory, and then she shifts to thrones and poverty and riches. Do you find that a bit strange? Do you want to ask Mary, what's going on here? Well, in this particular gospel account, Luke wants to make the point crystal clear that Jesus came into the world to save sinners, to rescue rebels, to welcome the outcasts. He shows that Jesus is a king. He is the true king, but he's different from every other king. And his kingdom is different than any other kingdom. By way of comparison, Matthew's gospel really emphasizes the growth and the expansion of the kingdom. Where Luke's gospel highlights the invitation of the kingdom. That the kingdom of God has opened wide its doors and invites everyone to come. Now this goes against all expectations. You'd think if a king was coming to invite people into his royal kingdom, he'd be looking for all the impressive people, the important people, the well-educated people, the affluent people, the successful people, the powerful people. But that's not on Jesus's agenda at all. And before Jesus was ever born, we get a glimpse of this in his mother's song. Mary looks around and she realizes that God is using the infertile wife of an old priest and an unwed pregnant teenager to bring the savior of the world into the world. Clearly, God wasn't looking for someone impressive. Apparently, he's the kind of God who likes to pick a bunch of insignificant nobodies and do unspeakably amazing things through them. Mary's song echoes the song of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 2, which is really setting up the rise of David from a lowly, insignificant shepherd to a mighty king. And so Mary, she, she sees what God has done throughout history, and she sees what he's doing now through herself and Elizabeth, and she sees their experiences as kind of a, a pattern or a paradigm for what the baby in her womb is going to one day do on a massive scale. And throughout the Gospel of Luke, this is exactly what we'll see Jesus do time and time again. This song just reverberates throughout this Gospel. Jesus makes it clear that his kingdom is an upside-down kingdom. 
an inside out kingdom that under his rule, under his reign, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. That in his kingdom, suffering leads to glory and the cross leads to the crown and death leads to resurrection. The grace of Jesus is deeply subversive. It's disruptive. It goes against the grain of the religious status quo, both of his day and of ours. So let's think about these descriptions. The proud, the rich, the mighty on their thrones. What's this about? Is this about material wealth and power or something else? What is Mary singing about? Well, in one sense, these aren't simply the materially rich or people literally seated on thrones of political power because it's, it's really those who don't recognize their need for Jesus. Those who think they're too good for him. Those who don't want his pity and his mercy and his condescension. It's those who are prideful in their hearts, as verse 51 says. Those who don't think they need Jesus, they think they're doing just fine without him. And yet, at the same time, material wealth and comfort and power can be incredibly seductive. If our lives seem to be going pretty well, it can be easy not to even feel our need for Jesus. Why do I need him? I'm handling things just fine on my own. But when our lives start to fall apart, we realize that all the trinkets that we trusted in were just a sham. The big bank account, the stable job, the good health, the lavish lifestyle, it... All of it was just a placebo to help us ignore the depth and the painful reality of our true need. But throughout this gospel, Jesus shows that the grace of God absolutely levels the playing field. That the cross of Christ is the great equalizer. It shows us that we are all equally in need of God's mercy. We're all equally sinners And we've all equally been offered a great salvation in Jesus. Mary's joy in the Lord is only deepened and sweetened as she she sees the depth of her own need. Back in verse 48, she says, He has looked on the humble estate of his servant. Literally, we could translate that He has paid attention to the lowliness or the humiliation of his slave. Mary realized that she had nothing to offer God. Mary realized that she had nothing to impress him with. That there was no way on earth that she could ever earn his favor. And yet, even though Mary deserved nothing, the Lord gave her everything. And even though we deserve nothing, the Lord has given us everything through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. She rejoices that her God brings down the mighty from their thrones. What does that look like, Mary? You sound like a revolutionary. Well, it doesn't look like political revolution. That's not what Luke's gospel is about at all. It's not what Jesus is up to at all. No, bringing the mighty down from their thrones looks like what Jesus refers to later in Luke chapter 11, where he holds forth the repentance of the city of Nineveh from the book of Jonah. He holds that up as an example. So listen to the words of Jonah chapter 3 and verse 6. The word reached the king of Nineveh. That is, the word of Jonah's preaching reached 
this wicked, tyrannical, pagan ruler. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. He said, who knows, perhaps God may relent. The prideful thoughts of his heart were scattered by the Lord. He was brought down from his throne. He humbled himself and begged for God's mercy. And he found it. Because this is the God who delights to show mercy to the undeserving and to forgive the seemingly unforgivable. That king came down from his throne and found joy in bowing before this holy and merciful God. And can I tell you just what brings me unbelievable joy personally? It's the fact that I am a Christian at all. That blows me away. I was so hardened to the gospel. I was so resistant. I was so rebellious. I was digging my heels in and Christ showed me mercy. I was so arrogant, and he scattered the thoughts of my proud heart. And sometimes I just sit back and laugh, or I sit back and sing. Because it's hard to comprehend all that the Lord has done for me when I deserved none of it. So if you want something to sing about, just think back to your life before Christ. And think about your life now. And of course, none of us are where we'd like to be. But praise God, we have been redeemed. You've been rescued. You've been forgiven. You've been transformed. You've been taken from darkness and into light. He who is mighty really has done great things for me. And he's done great things for you. So Mary's song is scripture saturated. It is intimately personal. It's deeply subversive. And I don't know about you, but I feel my cynicism towards musicals fading away. Her joy is contagious. I really want to sing. And this song, it started with Mary. Zechariah and Simeon will join in. Even the angelic armies of heaven will join in. And as the redemptive reign of Jesus spreads throughout the world, so the joyful praises of Jesus will spread to every corner of this earth. That song is building. It's building even now. The symphony of salvation is coming to a glorious crescendo. And one day, all creation will join together in singing, He who is mighty has done great things for us, and holy is his name. Let's pray. Father, we give you glory. Great are you, Lord, and greatly to be praised, and your glory is unsearchable. Help us to see you clearly. Help us to see you in all of your glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And through your spirit, through your word, ignite our hearts. Fill us with joy. Restore to us the joy of our salvation. And by your spirit, lead us to sing your praises. Lead us into deeper joy. Lead us into deeper worship. Lead us into deeper praise. Help us to sing now. For the glory of your great name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.